greatest machines ever built. They destroy whole nations. They carry goods around the world. They even carry other ships. They capture the wind, fulfill our dreams, and transport us in luxury. Seventy percent of our planet is covered with ocean. Nations that have controlled the oceans have controlled the world. Today, we build mighty warships like the USS Mitcher to patrol the seas and keep the peace. They can defend the aircraft carrier. They can defend convoys. They can strike targets ashore. They can hunt submarines. We have also built ships of great beauty that can take us on nostalgic journeys into the past. It's absolutely incredible. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world. But our efforts to conquer the high seas have often ended in tragedy. The greatest and fastest ship of its day, the Titanic, sank with the loss of 1,503 lives. My brother and I were in bed, and they suddenly heard a bang, a crash, and my father said, I'll go up on deck and see what has happened. He came back and said, apparently, the ship has struck an iceberg. Thousands of ships have sunk to the ocean floor. But today, the great ocean liners are much safer. The most opulent liner afloat is the Explorer of the Seas. She's the biggest cruise liner ever built. From bow to stern, she's over 1,000 feet long, longer than three football fields end to end. It truly is the world's largest cruise ship afloat today. And if we had every cabin full, with every bed full, every crew member, every guest, we're talking about 5,040 people. The Explorer cost $600 million and took three years to build. This is the ultimate in luxury travel. The Royal Promenade is four decks high and as wide as a three-lane highway. They even change the elevator carpets every day. Explore the Seas is out of this world. You don't believe you're on board a cruise ship. You don't believe that you can see the things you see on board a cruise ship. People are making their dreams come true just by being on a ship of this size. There are 14 elevators, 15 decks, 16 bars, and five restaurants. On this voyage, the ship is leaving Southampton, England, the same port that the Titanic left back in 1912. Unlike that doomed ship, Explorer of the Seas will spend her days carrying holiday makers around the Caribbean. In charge of this giant ship is Captain Olaf Niesitter. The bridge is so massive, he crosses from one side to the other on a scooter. This is the biggest and most complex ship he has ever commanded. It's uh, quite a lot of responsibility, I must say. And especially, you can feel it, um, the, the bigger the vessel is, the more responsibility. More people, more equipment, definitely the workload is much higher. And uh, we need about 12... Despite her size, the ship is surprisingly maneuverable. Six bow and stern thrusters can turn this 50,000 ton monster on a dime. They can also perform like an anchor and hold the ship rock steady. In 
charge of the passengers is hotel director Bob Tavadia. And you can imagine that we've got 1,557 cabins on board. And when you talk about double occupancy and every single bed being occupied, you're talking about 3,817 guests, not to take into account the 1,223 employees on board. So that's a lot of cleaning, that's a lot of washing to do, but we achieve it. The luxurious Royal Suite has a baby grand piano and an Italian marble bathroom. This is the most luxurious ship that Bob Tavadia has ever worked on. And every time I get up in the morning and come down, I go, wow, that's a great place to work at. And I think what really makes me really happy is every time somebody new comes on board, they reflect the same experiences and feelings that I do, and that sort of really makes me excited about the whole thing. The idea of luxury cruise liners has been around for over 100 years. Before the age of the plane, liners were the only method of crossing the great oceans. Ships like the Lusitania epitomized all that was best in ocean liners. Rich passengers had to spend days at sea, and they wanted luxury. The pinnacle of elegance was the Ile de France, launched in 1926. At the time, it was the largest ship ever built, and its decor rivaled the very best hotels. There was competition to see which country could build the fastest and most stylish ship. But the age of the great ocean-going liner was nearing its end. It was becoming easier to cross the Atlantic by air. Now, cruise ships are making a comeback. On the Explorer of the Seas, the entertainment below decks is out of this world. The bars are an interior designer's dream. The Imperial Dining Room has three tiers, seating nearly 2,000 people, one of the largest restaurants anywhere in the world. Food is included, of course your entertainment, and then what is so great and different as well is the next day or two days later you're into a whole new world. You get to go off the ship and experience a brand new port of call. But I truly think that this ship is the best port of call out of anywhere we go, because you can do everything here. But conditions on board a cruise ship aren't always as advertised in the brochure. Even ships this size have to contend with extreme weather. In 1956, the Andrea Doria collided with another liner in dense fog and sank in the Atlantic with a loss of 51 lives. And in 1991, the Oceanos left Cape Town, South Africa and headed straight into a terrible storm. The ship took on water and slowly started to capsize. The Coast Guard managed to get all the passengers off the sinking ship before it finally disappeared beneath the waves. Could a similar tragedy happen to a modern cruise ship? If you're in the worst circumstances, it could happen to any ship. But they are really built very safely these days. The latest cruise ships have intelligent radar to keep them a safe distance from any other ships or obstacles. But they still use lookouts as a backup. If the unthinkable did happen, there are watertight compartments to contain any flooding. And there are 26 lifeboats with enough capacity for all the passengers and crew. It is forbidden to have less capacity of rescue equipment than passengers these days, of course. So the ship is uh, quite safe in that respect. But not all liners have carried enough lifeboats. And the result was a horrific loss of life in one of the worst maritime disasters of all time. Two and a half miles down in the North Atlantic, lies the wreck of a ship 
that has held our morbid fascination for nearly a century. It was once the greatest ship afloat, a symbol of man's ability to conquer the elements. Now it is nothing more than a mass of twisted, rusting iron, a grave for the 1,503 people who died with her. The Titanic Memorial in Belfast, Northern Ireland, lists the names of all those who died that terrible night. Even today, no one is exactly sure why this reputedly unsinkable ship foundered. In this luxurious ship were the people of many nations and many classes. Millionaires, aristocrats, there were young couples on their honeymoon. Men, women... The sinking of the Titanic has become part of our culture. A man who built the ship. Emigrants from all over Europe. The Titanic was built in Belfast by the Harland and Wolf Company for the White Star Line. She was 882 feet long and was as high as a 10-story building. She was the largest machine ever built. The Titanic was the height of glamour and reflected the newfound wealth of the Edwardian age. Her maiden voyage was to take her from Southampton, England to New York City. Her captain, Edward J. Smith, was under pressure from Titanic's owners to get to New York as quickly as possible. Despite reports of icebergs, he ordered full steam ahead. His decision to push through an ice field at over 20 knots would prove to be fatal. At 11.38 p.m., an iceberg was sighted. Quartermaster Robert Hitchens was ordered to put the wheel hard to starboard, and the propellers were put into reverse. But it was too late. The ship couldn't maneuver fast enough to avoid a collision. The iceberg scraped along a 300-foot section of the ship, buckling plates, popping rivets, and puncturing a series of small holes. Immediately, water started to flood into the ship. David Livingstone is a naval architect at Harland and Wolf and a Titanic expert. Once Titanic had hit that iceberg in the way that she did and she held five compartments, uh, she was doomed from that moment. Uh, the amount of water she was taking on board is maybe 25,000 tons an hour. Now there are no vessels today who would have the capacity of pumping that amount of water. Ironically, if the ship had struck the iceberg head-on, the outcome might have been different. Calculations have shown that if she hit it head-on, then probably um, Titanic would have crumpled the first two compartments, but she would have survived. How many people are on board? 2,200 or more. And room in the boats for... When the Titanic hit the iceberg that night, there were 2,200 passengers on board. Among them was Milvina Dean. She was nine weeks old, and her family was emigrating to America. At the time, there was a general shortage of coal, and the ship they were booked on didn't have enough. So they were transferred to the Titanic. Being the maiden voyage, it's very important. The coal had to go on the Titanic. So my father, of course, was delighted, and my mother. And so we were on the Titanic. Milvina herself was too young to remember, but her mother told her what happened on that tragic night. My brother and I were in bed, and they suddenly heard a bang, a crash. And my father said, I'll go up on deck and see what has happened. He came back, 
and said apparently the ship has struck an iceberg. Get the children out of bed and up on deck as quickly as possible. The family managed to reach the lifeboats. My mother said goodbye to my father and he said I'll be over, see you later. And she was helped into life at number 13. And I was so small they couldn't hold me so I was put into a sack and put in lifeboat number 13. And after my mother was in the um, lifeboat, she found that she had me, not my brother. One hour after the Titanic sank, a British ship, the Carpathia, picked up 705 survivors from the lifeboats, including Milvina Dean. Her three-year-old brother had survived in another lifeboat. When we were rescued by the Carpathia, there he was, another passenger had looked after him. So that was one a relief off her mind. She was so pleased to see him, but she thought he'd gone too. Her father never made it to a lifeboat. My father drowned, but he was never found. His body was never found. We were saved by my father being so quick on the uptake because so many people thought the, the ship wouldn't sink. It was unsinkable. So they weren't hurrying, they weren't worrying. It wouldn't sink. And I think that is partly how we were saved because so many steerage people were not saved. Two and a half hours after hitting the iceberg, the Titanic finally plunged to the bottom of the ocean where she lay undisturbed until 1985. There have been many theories as to why the iceberg caused so much damage. One was that the quality of the steel in the Titanic's hull was inferior. But her sister ship, the Olympic, was made from the same material. The steel that the Olympic was built from would have been identical to the steel uh, from which Titanic was built. If we remember that Olympic sailed quite happily uh, until about 1936 when it was scrapped, I think we've got to come to the conclusion that the material, the metal, was fit for purpose. If you hit an iceberg, if you hit an immovable object, uh, you're going to do damage. I don't believe that the uh, material, that the steel or the rivets, uh, played any significant part in uh, making that damage worse. In 1998, David Livingstone visited the Titanic. The most disturbing thing was seeing shoes. Well, there was quite a collection of shoes. They were, they were all they were men's shoes and, and ladies' shoes and, and children's. This thought crosses your mind like, you know, the last people who walked in this bridge were the crew and the, the, and the officers of Titanic. And you, you'd got to think, what were those people thinking? The Titanic disaster stunned the world. The greatest machine of its day had failed. But now, the Titanic is about to be reborn and finally complete its original journey to New York. Titanic will once again rule the waves. A business consortium is building Titanic II. They've commissioned a team of designers to create the most majestic ship and ever built. Move forward with a selection of them and, and start using some of the original carpet designs which are just just uh, located. You know, I think it's important that we kind of replicate some of this. Although we are designing for the 21st century, you know, you can offer a very contemporary cabin mm. that is is very high tech in terms of its equipping and you could actually offer at the complete other extreme, virtually an Edwardian mm. cabin. One of the team dedicating their lives to keeping the Titanic dream afloat is Mark Blackburn. In simple terms, Titanic II will be a much more sophisticated vessel than Titanic I. Titanic was the most sophisticated and elegant of, of ships of its day, but we, are, we will take that, we will, we will play upon that, and we will, in, we will build on that to make a much more sophisticated ship. But when people come onto this vessel, they will feel like they are boarding a Titanic, they are boarding a classic Edwardian Ocean liner, so that they get a vessel which is designed to draw on the past, but to operate in, in the future market. 
It will look the same, but the new ship will be 200 feet longer than the original Titanic and will be much safer. It'll have to have a different design of hull and the watertight compartments that so the damage stability of the ship can be assessed so that if it is hit by something by accident, then we know that it, it will remain safe and none of our passengers will come to harm. Everything that we do in this project has the spirit of Titanic at its very core, the spirit of all those people who built it and, and put their lives into constructing that ship. And we hope it will be um, a suitable memorial to those people. Nostalgia is back in fashion. This luxury cruise ship is also inspired by a sunken vessel. These passengers are going cruising on the Royal Clipper, the most luxurious sailing ship in the world. Based on a German vessel, the Preussen, which sank at the start of the last century, the Royal Clipper is the largest sailing ship afloat today, the only five-masted ship in existence. One of the first passengers was tall ships expert Bernard Barden. This ship is one of the greatest ships, I think, of all time. It really is, I think, a sailing man's ship. There hasn't been a ship built like this in decades. The gentleman who built this ship is a lover of tall ships, and I really admire him for it because I love the tall ships as well. And this is my opportunity to sail again on a ship like this. I never thought it would be possible in my lifetime. It's marvelous, it's exquisite, it's beautiful. The Clippers were cargo ships built to carry grain, tea, and raw materials around the world. These wooden ships braved freezing seas and giant waves to circumnavigate the globe, bringing their essential cargoes to Europe and America. Now this clipper is used to carry passengers. Where the original Preussen carried chemicals in a massive hold below decks, the Royal Clipper has a swimming pool, casino, health spa, and luxurious dining room which can seat 225 people. On the old cargo ships, the sails were raised by hand. The crew of the Royal Clipper uses power winches. The skipper of the poison would have been absolutely amazed to see 200 passengers lying about on the deck in their deck chairs while the sailors are pulling all the sheets above their heads. In the old days, you didn't dare do that. Someone would be cut in half or pulled overboard. The Royal Clipper is over 400 feet long. There are 42 sails with a total area of over 56,000 square feet. Fully rigged, she has a top speed of 17 knots. It's an absolute unique opportunity for anyone who loves the sea to sail on a five-masted full reach. It's absolutely incredible. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world. This is a unique, unique vessel. I'm sorry. It just, it breaks me up. It's just fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. We have always built ships of beauty, but we have also built ships of war, and we have made the sea a battlefield. In the calm waters of the Caribbean, the world's most technologically advanced naval force is on a training exercise. 
A battle group of powerful warships is testing the latest weapons. The destroyer USS Mitcher is one of the most sophisticated war machines in the world. Hidden behind its airtight doors and secret reinforced compartments are deadly weapons and 300 highly trained sailors. In charge is Commander Frank Pendle. It's a wonderful ship, a beautifully designed. Sea keeping is, is superb. The sensors are unequaled. Uh, the weaponry is, is absolutely first rate. Destroyers are the most versatile ships in the battle group. Being multi-mission, they can do a number of functions. They can defend the aircraft carrier, they can defend convoys, they can strike targets ashore, they can use their guns to support marines ashore, they can hunt submarines. Extremely useful ships, used in a number of roles. They are loaded with an awesome selection of high-tech weapons. The one that comes first to mind is surface-to-air missiles, uh, a very lethal and uh, far-range weapon. In the uh, cells forward, vertically launched torpedoes, uh, which can hunt submarines. And also uh, Tomahawk uh, land attack strike missiles. As part of the maneuvers, the USS Mitcher will test fire SM2 missiles. These missile tests are rare and have drawn a crowd to the bridge. In real combat, if the ship was ready to fight, most of these people would be in positions throughout the ship, being prepared for damage control, evaluating computer systems, uh, preparing uh, meals, or getting ready for battle damage, should it occur. During launch, no one is allowed outside on deck. Captain Pandolf orders the firing from the Combat Information Center. With the firing range clear, countdown begins. With the hotel whiskey, they have a green range for Delta's firing event. Weapons red and tight. Green range, air warning red, weapons tight, over. Captain Mike. Zero, two, six, five. They hurtle towards the target at speeds of 2,000 miles per hour, almost three times the speed of sound. SS Birds Away 80265. Hotel Whiskey, this is Juliet. Birds Affirm, Birds Away 5005. A perfect hit. Uh, the missile X today has gone very well, very well. So to see it all come together in a flash of an eye uh, and then have a uh, uh, direct hit. Uh, it's, it's, it's very satisfying, and, and the guys are really happy, very proud. Destroyers have a wide range of defensive maneuvers. The engines generate 100,000 horsepower and can propel the ship from zero to 30 knots in under 60 seconds. It makes us very maneuverable and allows us to outmaneuver any threats that we may have. If we're out hunting a submarine and uh, they fire a torpedo at it, we can do some maneuvers that we may be able to outmaneuver the torpedo, thus saving us from having to deal with all of the damage that it may inflict on us. But there isn't a ship afloat that can't be sunk. One warship thought to be indestructible, the mighty Bismarck, the pride of the German Navy. Launched in 1939, at the time she was the most powerful battleship ever built. The hunt for the Bismarck was one of the most famous sea battles of World War II. In the early years of the war, Britain stood alone against the might of the Nazis. To get food and raw materials, Britain relied on convoys carrying supplies across the Atlantic. The Bismarck was a massive threat to these convoys. She had to be stopped. Sir Ludovic Kennedy is a respected author and historian. He was an officer on the British destroyer HMS Tartar, 
one of the ships given the task of hunting the Bismarck. We knew for a long time that the Bismarck was preparing uh, to go into the Atlantic and cause havoc on the sea lanes between us and America. We couldn't have survived the war if that lifeline had been broken. The British ships, including the most famous in the fleet, HMS Hood, took on the Bismarck in the North Atlantic with disastrous consequences. One of Bismarck's shells scored a direct hit on the hood, piercing her main deck. The shell smashed down through the decks and exploded inside the ammunition store, destroying the entire ship. After the hood was destroyed, the Bismarck disappeared. The Catalina seaplane was dispatched to find her. After 20 hours searching, the Bismarck was discovered heading towards France, about 600 miles from the coast. The hunt was on again. Airplanes from the aircraft carrier Ark Royal attacked the Bismarck with torpedoes. There was one hit on the Bismarck somewhere forward, but the one that did the real damage hit the rudder and jammed the rudder of the Bismarck at 15 degrees to port. And this made her quite unmaneuverable. With her rudder out of action, the Bismarck was now heading straight towards the British fleet. Although she couldn't be steered, she was still deadly. The British decided to wait until the next day to try to sink her. Everybody was very nervous because her gunnery had sunk the hood in five minutes that uh, she might do the same to us. From HMS Tartar, young officer Kennedy watched the battle unfold. I remember the morning of the battle. I remember the color contrast, very blustery wind, green waves and uh, white crests, and then the gray of the British ships and the black of the Bismarck, and brown cordite smoke drifting up into the sky. And then the two battleships, Rodney and King George V, opening fire, and the Bismarck returning the fire. The guns of these two battleships gradually reduced the Bismarck to a shambling wreck. And the carnage must have been unbelievable. Gradually, as the action ended, I saw for the first time the human side of this story, a trickle of men running from the forward right to the rear, to the quarter deck, and then throwing themselves over the side to get away from this raging inferno on board. And that was quite a sight, something I've never forgotten. Modern day warships, with all their technology, can still be crippled by a determined enemy. In October 2000, the destroyer the USS Cole was docking in Yemen when it was damaged by terrorists. A huge hole was blown in the side of the ship and she was unable to sail home. So she was loaded and carried back to the US on one of the most powerful ships in the world, the Blue Marlin. The Blue Marlin is a heavy lift vessel designed to transport giant loads, including ships around the world. This massive vessel is 712 feet long and loads its cargo by sinking its deck under the water. Today, the Navy needs to transport two mine hunters to the Persian Gulf, a difficult journey that could damage the $145 million vessels. Overseeing the operation for Military Sea Lift Command is Captain Gregan Gant. The Blue Marlin is essentially a series of large water tanks. 
It sinks by ballasting, by, by pumping water into her tanks. Once the mine hunters are aboard, she will have to pump a corresponding amount of water out to raise that weight plus her own weight out of the water. To prevent any damage to their fiberglass hulls, the engineers build wooden blocks for the ships to sit on. We always have nerves uh, in any situation where, where you're going to be docking a vessel. When you dock two vessels side by side, it makes it uh, more tricky. When the blocks are ready, the blue marlin is moved into deeper water. She is moored. Then her tanks are opened, and she starts to sink. It's a slow process. Ten hours later, and the ship's deck has submerged 16 feet, ready for the two mine hunters. The trickiest part of this operation will be positioning the two mine hunters safely over their blocks and then deballast this ship so that it touches the block safely and doesn't cause any damage to the mine hunters themselves. The first of the mine hunters, the USS Cardinal, is gently maneuvered into position over the Blue Marlin. If the Cardinal is moved too quickly, she could easily smash into the central mooring tower, damaging the delicate hull. Everything worked fine, and the first ship's in position. The second ship is now maneuvering along the starboard side of Blue Marlin, and there'll be lines going across to her uh, very soon. When the second mine hunter, the USS Raven, is in position, the Blue Marlin's engines start to pump water out of the hull to raise the deck. A diver is sent down to check that the two mine hunters are safely over their blocks. Once he gives the all clear, the blue marlin continues pumping out the water. As soon as the deck of the blue marlin has surfaced, Captain Gant can check the blocks one last time. The blocks all look good, they were cut well. Uh, there's a few that would need to be shimmed and modified, but all in all, there's no damage to the vessel, and I feel much better now than, than an hour ago. In 1988, Captain Gant was responsible for loading the first naval ship ever carried on a heavy lift vessel. The USS Samuel B. Roberts was transported back to the U.S. after it struck a mine in the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War. That ship was large enough that in order to submerge the carrier vessel, we had to go 50 miles offshore. So the, the submergent was done uh, in an unprotected waters. We were subjected to both the wind and the waves, and the, the vessel was brought in carefully. The USS Roberts was carried 10,000 miles back home safely for repairs. Ships like the Blue Marlin are gigantic, able to carry huge loads, but they are tiny compared to the largest vessels ever built, the super tankers. The modern world is dependent on fossil fuels. To keep us going, we require a steady supply of oil. The only way to satisfy our ever-increasing demand is to ship it around the globe in giant super tankers. One of the busiest oil terminals in Europe is Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Waiting to depart is the Opelia, one of the largest super tankers in operation. Fully loaded, she weighs an incredible one-third of a million tons. She is 1,000 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 200 feet high. The Ophelia can carry two million barrels of oil. To put it into perspective, if you were to load it into the tanks of ordinary family cars, five million cars you could fill just from 
one cargo on this tanker. That's sufficient oil if you put it into one car to go right around the world 100,000 times, just on the oil that we're carrying at the moment. Below decks, the crew keeps a close eye on the potentially lethal cargo. They are continually on alert for fire. The fumes from crude oil are extremely combustible, and the slightest spark can set off a raging inferno. Modern tankers like the Opelia prevent fires by covering the oil with a safety blanket of inert gases. The Opelia also has a double hull to prevent leakage. The ship has a crew of 21, most of them to keep the vast engines in running order. Auxiliary engines provide the electricity for the ship, three megawatts of power, enough to light a small town. The main engines produce 31,000 horsepower and drive a single huge propeller. The ship can reach speeds of 16 knots. When it's at full speed, the momentum is huge, and it takes an enormous distance to slow down and stop. If we wanted to come to a complete stop at sea, it would actually take about one and a half miles. That's if the ship was fully laden. At sea, these giant vessels can be maneuvered with relative ease, but coming into port is a different story. Container ships are the lifeblood of world trade. Every day, millions of tons of goods are shipped around the world. The Sovereign Maersk is one of the largest container ships in the world. It's over 1,100 feet long and almost 150 feet wide. It can carry 6,600 containers, each weighing up to 14 tons. It's coming to unload at the port of Felixstowe on the east coast of England. Because of its size, a specialist pilot travels out to the ship to guide it up the narrow channel into port. As long as the Empire State Building, wider than a six-lane highway, as the wind blows, the ship drifts, the tide is blowing the ship around as well. And not only are you driving a very large lorry without any brakes, but somebody's moving the road as well. Captain Chris Pearson has been a pilot for 19 years. The pilot service is needed for local knowledge. The charts can show all the tidal streams, the buoys, but you still need somebody on the bridge with intimate local knowledge of how to work with the tugs, and how the tide is flowing at any one particular point. Once on board, he takes complete charge of the ship. Steady on 360. 360. I'm having to steer against the incoming tide so that the ship tracks up the deep water channel in a straight line. The channel at Felixstowe has been specially dredged to allow the giant ships to reach the dock. Once in the port, the Sovereign Maersk is maneuvered towards the dock using tugs. She is one of eight container ships which will unload here today. It's now the busiest port in the country for containers. Two and a half million in one year. And we do 25,000 shipping movements a year. About 85 shipping movements a day. Every year, Around 70 million containers are shipped around the world. Without container ships, our lives would come to a complete standstill. The 
great oceans are the highways of the world. But we must never forget that even the biggest and the best ships are no match for the awesome power of the sea. If you like this TLC show, you can own it on video. Call this number and get your own high-quality VHS tape of the episode you just watched for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Satisfaction guaranteed. Call now to order. Next on TLC, Man vs. Ocean. She sailed right underneath the water. The sea is the mother. You respect it, you challenge it, you lose. Start up all the go airplanes, start them up. World's greatest ships, dangerous seas. Next on TLC.